Uh, which one was the first one? Someone dropped a copy. Which one was the first one? Okay, then we can charge this one. Good. So it is permissible to do it in two significant figures. The next question I would not consider to be a stage one question, but with direction, it would be nice if you kind of understood what was going on. Now when you think about any of these questions here, you've got to remember that force has a magnitude and a direction to the vector quantity. So Q2 is, is getting pushed by the force from Q1 there, and it's heading to the right. Now, if I was to push on the wall like this, and I ain't going nowhere. That's because the wall is pushing back on me with an equal and opposite direction. Charlie, can you come up, please? Mm -hmm. How much do you weigh, Charlie? Uh, 58. 58 what? Kilos. Huh. That's not the weight, that's your mass. Remember, weight involves gravity. Yeah. You will get weight in Newton's. Hands up. You ready? <laughs> do you even lift? No. <laughs> Now, nah, so good. So my force was greater than Charlie's force, you see. So the arrow that was coming from me is greater than the arrow that's coming from you. I remember Dominique's had a crack at this before. I think you almost pulled me over, didn't you? Yeah. Oh. You're right? Yeah. Yeah, cool. So you've got to think of force as in actual force. It's just that the force that was between me and Charlie then, I'm going to need to put alcohol in my hands now because it's coronavirus. 
Um, the force between me and Charlie then was a contact force because we are touching each other. I mean, ignoring the fact that nothing ever touches from what we discussed before. Oh God, it is a non-contact force. I don't want to think about it now. We regard it as a contact force. The electric fields that exist between Q1 and Q2, the forces that kept Georgina's hair on end when we had the Van de Graaff going, that's a non-contact force. The problem I have is, you know, the electrons in your fingers touching the electrons of mine and really all forces are non-contact, I guess. I don't know. I need to think more deeply about this, but anyway. You've got to look at it from a narrow perspective. So, let's look at the next question. Sphere Q3 has a negative charge, and it's to be placed in a line through the centres of Q1 and Q2. Now, in stage 2, when you've got two charges, they're always occurring on a line. In stage 3, you're going to get one and, uh, like above or below, and it becomes all right angle triangles and stuff. So you get it in um, two dimensions, or is it's just one dimension for us. So, somewhere on that line, Q3 is going to go. Q3 is negative. And what it does is it makes the force from Q1 on Q2 become nothing. So whatever it does, it cancels out that force error arrow from Q1. Totally cancels it out. And it's saying, explain why sphere Q3 must be placed on the left of sphere Q2. Well, I'd like to pose this um, situation here to think about which is the opposite of what they're saying. Instead of being on the left, I'll put Q3 on the right. Now, Q3 is negative. What does a negative and a positive do? Yeah, they're trapped. They're opposite, don't they? So Q2 is going to get pulled towards Q3 whilst getting pushed by Q1. So that force is going that way. That force is going that way. They're going to get added, and Q2 is going to get pushed that way. Now, that's not zero, is it? Definitely not zero. So Q3 must be placed on this side here, because what's it going to do to Q2 then? Which way is it going to pull? To the right or to the left? Yeah. yeah, the left. It's going to pull Q2 towards the left. Now, if we've got... Jeez, I need footsteps enough to shake. If you've got Q2 being pulled to the left because Q3 is here, and then you've got Q1 pushing to the right, then you've got a left and a right, and they're going to opposite oppose each other. And that's the only way to cancel it out. So I've written, in order to oppose the direction of force Q1, which operates to the right, force Q3 must operate to the left. This will cancel out force Q1. Or this will cancel force Q1 out. The only way to do this is to have Q3 on the left. If it's on the right, force Q1 and force Q3 add. So the difficulty in a question like this, there's no calculation involved is taking the arrows and putting those kind of concepts into words and I've used the diagram to answer it. I would imagine that my answer here in the absence of this diagram would be sufficient to acquire my two marks at the stage two level because they do assume a certain level of knowledge. However, for us in stage one and for those stage two students watching, I think putting that there hopefully makes a bit more sense of the question. All right, which one's the next one? experiences a repulsive force of that many newtons, determine the magnitude and sign. Now when you see the word electron, what you know is that it has a charge. Now it's given to you on the formula sheet, the charge on an electron is 1.6 by 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So by writing electron, they've already given you a figure, and yet they haven't written the figure in there in numbers. So looking out for that kind of information is important. Oh. That's my son's Tamagotchi, I've got to figure out how the hell to make it work. 
Um, okay, point charge Q1. An experience is a repulsive force. Now, if the electron is experiencing a repulsive force, what's it going to tell you about the other sign on the other thing? Negative. Well, it's got to be negative, doesn't it? Because if it was positive, it's going to be attractive. So we've already determined the negative, but as a result of reading the word repulsive. Now, we also want to determine the magnitude. So when we're talking about the magnitude of a charge, we're talking about one of these cubes. Step one is to always write the equation. Again, for your stage twos, okay, one on four pi epsilon zero. So we start to rearrange the equation. I was using a big ass permanent marker, so I didn't have a lot of space, so I kind of branched out the local page. You can do the same if you want. There's no reason to have to confine it to these lines here. In fact, there'll always be extra lines at the back, but you can write it on a piece of scrap paper, shove it inside the exam. As long as it's written somewhere and we know what we're looking at, then that's perfectly acceptable. Um, so I'm taking R squared and I'm moving it up. Because you guys gotta be able to rearrange these formulas to make what you want the subject of the equation. I like to do the opposite, that's how I do it. So if R squared's divided, then if you put it on the other side, you're gonna times it. But there are those people that prefer to see something like times both sides by R squared. And if you times that side by R squared, then that cancels that out and uh, puts it in the correct location. If you need to do it that way, that's also fine. Okay, we only want one of the charges, which is Q2 in this case. So I take KQ1 there, and on that side it's time, so it's going to be divided when put on the other side, and it's going to give us Q2. So now I make Q2 the subject of the equation by putting it on the left. Force, radius squared, constant, and the charge on the electron, which I've now drawn out here. Being very careful to make sure that you don't forget to square the radius. Even A level stage two students forget to square it sometimes. Um, is there any other traps in this one? No, that's already in four meters, that's fine. Yep, so you just feed everything into the calculator and you come up with this answer here. Everything's in two significant figures, so I get my answer in two sig figs too. Remembering that you also need the units. Never forget the units. You lose marks for that. And I make it obvious what the sign is. So, one mark, two marks, three marks, four marks. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, the next one's a very much more difficult concept and uh, I don't think, unless there was a direct proportionality, that I would be requiring you to understand this. But when you look at physics, there's a number of proportionalities that exist. Force equals KQ1Q2 on R squared. When you look at Coulomb's law, force is directly proportional to charge. See, the bigger the charge is, the bigger the force is going to be. That's logical, right? Because they're both on the top of the fraction, that means the bigger one is, the bigger the other is. And this is this proportionality symbol that we use here. So if you double the charge, then you double the force. If you triple the force, you triple the charge. Radius is different though. If you turn on the Van der Graaff generator and you put your hands in there, you can feel it, right? But what happens as you walk away from it? You don't feel it, do you? If you put your finger right close to it, you'll be able to arc into your finger. But if I stand over here, is it going to shock me? No. As you're further away, you've increased that radius. So the more you increase the radius, the uh, less strength you're going to feel from the electric field. So it's the same with a magnet. If I oppose this, and I, I can literally feel the These are you know, the rare earths. Then the, the closer you put them, the more um, you can feel the force that may impose. So radius has a big effect. In fact, it's got a squared effect. So what we're looking at there is a the force is inversely proportional to one on radius squared. Because that, if, if none of this changes, so force is equal to KQ1Q2, so we don't alter, well the constant will never alter, not 
this universe. Q1 and Q2 stay the same, all right? Then what are you left with? Times one on R squared. So if that's the only thing we're changing, then the bigger that gets, what's going to happen to force? Yeah, it gets smaller. And not just smaller by much, but smaller by a squared value. So if you double it, what's 2 squared? Double the radius, quarter the force. How about triple? Yeah, 3 squared is 9. Triple the radius, one third, uh, one ninth the force. What happens if you half the radius? Force Force gets doubled if you half the radius? Yes. Okay. 2.5 squared, and then divide it into 1 and see what happens. See, if you double the radius, you get a quarter. So if you half the radius, what do you reckon is going to happen? Yeah, it's going to quadruple. It's the opposite. If you feed it into your calculator, you'll see it works. So, when you see a term like this, using proportionality, it means without doing any calculations, you don't feed it into the calculator to look at the numbers and compare them. When you see the word proportionality, you need to be drawing the proportional um, symbol. So, if the electron at the distance is double, so force is inversely proportional to radius squared, and 2 squared is 4. Therefore, force will be times a quarter. The force will be a quarter of its original amount. And that's the answer. Oh, give me three marks. Thank you, me. Yeah? Fairly high level concept there. Generally, stage two. What you guys need to be able to do is do the, um, the Coulomb's law question. This one's next, right? This. I think? Yes. Yeah, right. So this is what we saw yesterday in the um, video with Professor Julius Sunder Miller. He had those two little paper balls hanging on them strings, and he charged up the ebonite rod and held it near them, and they, they forced apart. So the concepts that you saw in there are actually occur in stage two physics exams. The diagram below shows the apparatus used to investigate Coulomb's law. Two charged spheres remain stationary due to the electrostatic force between them. The two spheres have a charge of that. They're both positive, that's why they're opposing. And also both of them have that charge. And the distance between each of their centers is 3.2 centimeters. Careful, that needs to be turned into meters. I mean, if you don't know that there's 100 centimeters per meter, you can also go to this uh, sheet here and see centimeters by 10 to the negative two. So if you have to, you times um, 3.2 by 10 to the negative two. Calculate the magnitude of the electric force that the sphere exerts on the other. When you see the word magnitude, that means that even though force is a vector quantity and needs a direction, the word magnitude means that you only need the amount of the units, but you don't need to state the direction. Now, how many significant figures am I going to be given my answer in here? Two. Again, two. So if we go to the calculation here, it's just simply feed the numbers in. This I would consider to be something you should be able to do at the stage one level. So already you can see you can already do exam questions from the end of stage two, and yet you haven't even finished term one, stage one. Force is constant Q1, Q2, and R squared, standard Coulomb's law formula. The difference here though is they both have the same charge. I'll make a point here. Remember, you don't feed the, the negatives or the positives in with the charge here, only ever the amounts for Q1 and Q2. 9 by 10 to the 9 by 3.4 by 10 to the negative 9 squared divide 0 0.032 squared. Now, I, I just turn centimetres into metres in my head. But if you need to do it, you can do 3.2 by 10 to the negative 2. That would also achieve the same answer because it's exactly the same number. And I get this force. There was a bunch of decimal points behind it, but I've ignored them because that's the answer. Never forget the units either. The units of force is the newton. Because Isaac Newton invented force and gravity. I love saying that, he invented gravity. Such a dumb statement. Next, all right. Okay. Oh, 
Let's just wrap and demonstrate something. Two point charges, Q1 and Q2, have equal magnitude. So they clearly have exactly the same amount of charge, but they're opposed. So what are they going to do? Attract. The charges are placed in a vacuum as shown in the diagram below. Now, electric fields can sometimes be demonstrated with the use of a magnetic field. So this little device here is a bunch of little iron rods. They're made for one of these, what do you call them? Where are their magnets? Can I have them please? Garen. Alright, so you can demonstrate a magnetic field using this. So if I put it in the middle, you can see the rods, the, the field going around the outside from north to south. Which one's the north pole, which one's the south? Which one's the north pole of the magnet, which one's the south? The answer is, who knows? <laughs> but what you've got to do is you get a magnet and the north pole, the north arrow of the magnet points to the south pole. The north always points to the south. And you say, ah, oh, but hold on. When I do navigation, especially if I'm an army cadet or something, north's always pointed to north. Well, here's the deal. When you're looking at the well, and here we've got the south pole here in Antarctica. This is my daughter made this in primary school, so I thought it was quite useful. North pole here. But the north compass points to the north, so it's pointing up that way. Well, guess what kind of magnetic pole this is? That's the south magnetic pole. And this is the north magnetic pole. So the south pole contains the north magnetic pole. Okay? Sound good? Yep. Now, I want to get two of these so they attract. All right, so these are opposing right now. I wonder if this is going to be. If you look at when they repulse here, you can see that hopefully there's like circles there, but they're pushing against each other. They're not joining. I don't know if that's entirely obvious. Now watch what happens when I flip one. You see those three that join up through the middle there? So when you oppose, the fields push against each other, which is what you feel when you when you hold those magnets together. They they really don't want to go together. Ah. So that's that opposing field. But then as soon as you flip one, look at that. You can see three lines going between them there. One straight between the two magnets and two curved. That's the attraction. So you can actually see it physically. So that's what occurs between electric fields too. When they oppose and when they attract. I'm going to upload on the um, distance learning website when I get around to finalising it. It should be this morning while we're in class. Um, when you see a positive and a negative and they're going to attract, you draw it like this. Straight line between them and curved lines like that. So that's what we saw there. I'll just do these ones. And that's where they pull. If they're the same charge, so let's say that one was actually negative, and they do this. And that's where they're pushing on each other. So hopefully that's what, so that's why when, when the little magnetic bar was in the centre there, it didn't have a line going like that when it was attractive. It was doing this. Because it wanted to get the hell out of there. It wanted to go up or down. Didn't want to be in the middle of two massively opposing neodymium magnetic fields. 
magnetic fields, electric fields, effectively work in the same way. One's magnetic, one's electric. But if you think of Georgina's hair and an electron on one hair and an electron on another hair, those two hairs are pushing on each other like that through the vacuum of space and time. Non-contact force. It's also the same when I'm pushing on child 10. We're not actually touching right now. It is the electrons that are between us that are forcing on each other. And remember, what's the, what happens to force the closer you get? Yeah, that's right. Remember, because force is inversely proportional to radius squared. The closer you are, the more you feel it. So you can push as hard as you want against your two hands, but you'll never get them to sort of push through each other without sort of moving everything and yeah, be a problem. All right. Now let's get to the actual question. We've drawn the field lines. Field lines aren't a stage one requirement. They're stage two. But because we're talking about force between point charges and applying Coulomb's law, I do like you to see a visual depiction of why the hell they're doing that. So there is a field, and that's how it works. The question is, the charges are 12 centimetres apart and exert an electric force of that magnitude. Show that the magnitude of each charge is that amount. Now, show is a special word. Show is different to magnitude. These are SACE words. These are action words that seek a particular kind of answer. Show means that you need to show all the decimal places, uh, decimal places and then you do this funny little it's approximately equal to symbol. So straight bottom of the equals, but then a wavy bit at the top and then you give the SACE answer, which is here. Now, a show question is great, because if once you've done the calculation, you don't get that, what does that tell you? You've done it wrong. So it's a nice way to know, oh yeah, I got that right. I've got those marks. Anyway, you need to rearrange the formula, which I've done there in the bottom here, because it wants the magnitude of the charge. Now, the key bit of information here is that the charges are of equal magnitude. So that helps because then you know that instead of having Q1 and Q2 because they're the same, you're just going to get Q squared. The same. Times the same thing by itself. 3 by 3 is 3 squared. So I write the full formula always first. Again, K for stage 1 is 1 on 4 pi epsilon 0 for stage 2. And now I'm going to start to rearrange it. So I squared the um, charge because I know they're the same. R squared is divided here, so we put it at the top, it's going to get times. And then we want the value of Q, so we're going to take the constant and stick it down the bottom. But we've got Q squared. Now we don't want Q squared, we want Q. So how do you get rid of a square? Well, you square root it. You square root the square, you're going to get Q. You square root the answer. Now that I've got that, and there are marks allocated to that rearrangement, I can now feed it into the answer which is the full square root of 2.09 by 10 to the negative 2, which is the force there given to me in the answer by 0.12 squared. Did it give me that radius in metres? No, 12 centimetres. Right. So just be careful here, there's another track. There would have been a number of stage 2 students when they did this in the exam which would have entered the radius as 12 metres and that would have given a very different answer. It would still give them 1.82 but to the negative 5 it would be to the negative 8 I think. No, negative 7. For which then they would just get confused and probably abandon the question. So turn centimetres into metres, 0.12 squared divide the constant and square root it. Now I get this here, and, and then this is the part where I said you've got to write all the decimal places in. So I write every single decimal place you get on the calculator. Doesn't matter how many of them there are, write them all. By 10 to the negative 5, and then I do approximately equal to 1.83 by 10 to the negative 5 kilograms. Never forget your units. Does that kind of seem achievable? At least for the... It would, you are going to need to know how to do Coulomb's law as a direct calculation to get the force and how to rearrange it either to get the radius or to get one of the charges. The constant will always be 9 by 10 to the 9 and you will always get that on the formula sheet. Okay, that's the answer to the exam questions.